This is an introduction <clears throat> to a series of films about an eight-volume autobiography. The first volume is called Beginnings and Endings, and it is about my first few years as a child or infant in India with my family and my early, the early life of my mother. The film is set in India from Assam up on the right hand side up to Agra in the north and down to the south of India as my family wandered around through the war years my father and mother often separated in the Second World War. The story really starts centuries before. This is one of my great-great-grandmothers and she was on one side of my family line through my mother and we have many of the papers uh, relating to her family going back into the 18th century and before. Another branch of the family, the Jones family, were lawyers, or he was a lawyer, uh, in the West Coast, and Sarah Harrison, my wife, has produced a volume of his letters and other papers, which has been published, John Jones. And so my family could be examined going back generations, even going back as far as my great-grandparents takes us to interesting times this is uh, a gentleman called Swinhoe, who was the first solicitor in Upper Burma from the 1880s, late 1880s onwards, and I have all his family papers, again, which I hope to edit. And he was a, a very colourful, interesting artist, among other things. His daughter, uh, Violet, was my grandmother, and Violet was born in Assam. She's there as the bride in the wedding photograph with my grandfather, William. So these are the people who played an enormously important part in my life because my parents being away much of my childhood in the tea gardens, these two looked after me when they retired to India, to England. And my grandmother was a very powerful and uh, interesting person who trundled around India with all her possessions, her dogs, and all these other things, including boxes and boxes of family papers, which she then bequeathed to me um, when she died. And so the early part of my family history can be traced from the papers which she very carefully saved. Indeed, I think I have one or two of the boxes which are on the roof of this vehicle. Later in their lives, my grandmother and grandfather retired uh, just at the end of the Second World War. He was a colonel in the um, Indian Army uh, and a very gentle and nice man. And my grandmother was a very formidable, powerful lady who looked after me very thoroughly for 20 odd years. Their daughter, they had four children, living children, their only daughter was my mother, Iris, who here at the age of about seven. Um, she also has written about her childhood, and one day I hope to edit her uh, diaries and letters and other materials. And she had a huge influence on me, as explained elsewhere. All this is uh, documented in detail in the 250-page book uh, on India in my autobiographical series. Iris came out to India when she was 16. Here she is on the boat with the dogs at the age of 16, um, fleeing from the imminent war, and also uh, in my grandmother's eyes, uh, heading towards hopefully a very good marriage with a rich um, young man, rich, handsome young man in India. And from earlier on, and particularly from this period, 
she began to keep a journal, and the first half of the book is based on this uh, journal and diary which she kept for uh, uh, nearly two years. And it is a very honest and interesting account, especially as Sarah, my wife, has footnoted it in detail, so you can see exactly the sort of people she was meeting uh, in the society of North India in the early years from 1939 to 1941. They were stationed mostly in Nainital, which was a tal means a lake, a northern um, station uh, where the British went in the hot weather. The army went up there. And so there's a good deal in the diary about sailing on this lake and various amorous adventures. And it gives a, a very interesting insight into life on the edge of the British Empire at that period. My mother was active in many ways. She went riding with her father, as you see her here, and she explored the countryside, and she was a very gifted observer and quite humorous. So it gives a good idea of the last days of the British Raj, which is what is happening. Just these are the last six years of the British Raj. Her, um, two of her brothers came out to fight in the war in the Gurkhas, and this is her oldest brother, Billy, who came out, and from time to time he would come on leave to see the family up in the hills. And his younger brother, uh, Richard, was in the Chindits and in the Gurkhas as well. So m many of the family, including my father, were fighting in the British Army. What strikes one about this diary uh, is that it seems very mature in many ways, and yet this is a, a very young girl, 16, 17-year-old girl, who um, you look into her soul as she keeps this private journal and diary and waits, and has many affairs, and waits for the right man to turn up, and many of them fail and nothing is happening. And then one enchanted evening, as she more or less puts it in her journal, Along came a very handsome young soldier, uh, Donald McFarland, my father. And within um, six months, uh, they were married. And um, the main part of the account is based on their relationship. I'm a peripheral figure in this first volume of my autobiography. My father had come out uh, from England to um, a tea estate in 1936. He was a very good sportsman on the right. You can see him here um, with his um, uh, playing instruments for polo and the team, the polo team he played for. He was also played for Scotland International. And he was a very handsome, very nice, very energetic, intelligent man who spent his life as a tea planter after the war. They got married <coughs> um, when my mother was only 18 and my father about 23. And here with the guard of honor, they're coming out of um, the church where they married. It was a deeply romantic relationship and the marriage was highly successful and lasted until my father suddenly died at the age of 60. The wedding photograph, inevitable wedding photograph itself, shows my mother and father in the middle, my grandfather to the left, grandmother to the right, an army general to the right, my uh, uh, godmother on the top row, second from right, and my uncle Billy on the top right. So this set off auspiciously, but very soon they were, began to be separated because my father was already a member of the army and later he helped to form uh, two battalions of the Assam Regiment. Here he is right in the middle at the end of the war, 1944, with the people he had been serving with frustratingly in the south of India, um, but very separated from my mother. So through most of the war, from 1942 anyway onwards, they were almost always separated. 
and it was only their letters which kept them united. And there are these wonderful set of letters. This is my mother's letter, Listen, darling, you must postpone, and so on. And she wrote wonderful letters to my father about her life, about me, about their deep love for each other. And it's this unique correspondence between two people for um, a year or a year and a half before it peters out that is the heart of the second part of the book. My father himself wrote back um, slightly less frequently and wasn't as good a yet letter writer, but his letters are very moving and deeply in, in love. It's about the joining of two souls who both felt they had had troubled upbringings and express this in intimate and deep letters to each other, which are all in the book. There were other sources, for example, they kept what's known as a, a baby's book, which uh, charted my development. So um, this is part of one page which shows exactly what I'm being fed month by month, porridge and egg, lunch, fish, liver, meat, etc. And there are uh, lots of other letters and uh, fragments which go into the book. Anyway, they married, my mother became pregnant, and I was born on the 20th of December 1941, the day that the Japanese uh, invaded many parts of Southeast Asia. So this was the real incursion of the Japanese and war swept towards us. But here I am very early in my life with my father and mother and little knowing the kind of desperate situation into which I was being born just on the edge. We were now in Shillong on the edge of the Burma uh, hills and um, occasionally I would be with my father uh, who is here invisibly throwing me in the air um, and I um, saw him intermittently through the war because in the first um, nine months he wasn't too far away, he was in Shillong and so on, and he used to come home on leave and my mother used to spend time with him in Shillong and um, they led some sort of family life together. Um, my grandmother Robert, my youngest uncle on the left with, in glasses, and me um, a few months old with my father present. So. He, I saw something of my father, but um, for the last two years of the war, I hardly saw him at all. And then when uh, I came back to England, I saw much less of him because he was mainly working on the tea garden. My mother was a very devoted and loving uh, mother. She was young, she was only um, 19. And of course she had ayahs and helpers to look after me, but she also took motherhood extremely seriously and gave me a huge amount of love and affection which, although of course I can't remember it, determined much of my life during these years. She um, had me carried around by various people in these rather delightful backpacks which they would, uh, a basket cut so that you could put the baby in the top. And so I was trundled around India from place to place and up and down the mountains and lived uh, what I now remember, or hardly remember, as a, a pleasant life apart from serious illness from time to time. The family would re reunite at times and on my, around my first birthday um, we reunited my grandfather on the left, Robert, uh, Richard next, then Robert in the front, who later became a, a, a member of parliament and a distinguished historian, my grandmother Billy and my mother and myself. And so we met at a hotel and celebrated Christmas and my first birthday there. And as I mentioned from time to time, my father would come home and uh, he was an adoring father for his letters to my mother show his deep concern for me and how he um, missed me and treasured our relationship and tried to uh, relive uh, what he considered to be his uh, unhappy childhood coming home from Mexico uh, and Texas when he was a child through my happiness. 
I grew up and in the last two um, years of the account are really very thin and partly based on photographs of me growing up, playing with my toys, um, learning to little skills like a, a tricycle um, and learning Urdu, the local language, which I was uh, taught and used in much of my life because there weren't many white children around and my closest friend, as my mother said, was the sweeper's son. Yeah, the sweeper's son with the with a little chick in his hand. And so I think this has had a very good effect on me that my earliest friendships were with my ayah, who was Mongolian, uh, hill tribe, lady and with ordinary Indians, low caste Indian in this case. And also I was surrounded by the love of not only my parents but my grandparents and from time to time uh, the visitors. Here I'm older down on the left hand corner and this is 1944 because my uh, first sister Fiona has been born in April and so um, we are on another of our reunions and it was Fiona who became my chief companion uh, later in the last two years uh, and from then onwards, here she is, from then onwards right through to my late teenage years Fiona and I were always very close and then later, 1946, my other sister Anne was born. So here the first account ends in 1945, when my um, parents, when the war ended, and they went off to their first tea estate, 250 pages of all this.